LML in 13. Dawn is the original ice, part two. Hey everyone, LML here. In part one, we discussed the theory that the sword, now known as Dawn, the giant white ancestral sword of House Dane, was actually once wielded by a Stark and was once called Ice. The theory goes that the sword, now known as Dawn, was once the dragon steel of the last hero, who may have been a Stark. The ancient Stark tradition of calling their ancestral sword Ice would have been done in remembrance of the one time when a Stark last hero carried a big, shiny, unbreakable white sword into battle against the others and ended the long night, bringing the dawn once again. For one reason or another, they seemed to have sent their white sword down to Starfall for safekeeping after the war for the dawn was over, but then continued to call their swords ice thereafter. That's the theory anyway, or at least the basics of it. Now to bolster the idea of a Stark wielding dawn, we took a look at the strange tendency of Stark swords to be described as running or shining with morning light especially when the Starks holding them are doing especially Starky things, like Rob posing as a King of Winter statue with his dire wolf at his side and his sword across his lap, or Jon Snow when he's executing a rogue Night's Watchman, just like his father did to open the story. Today we're going to add to this theory by taking a look at the symbolism of Dawn, House Dane, House Stark, and the others. Specifically, the symbolism relating to those things that suggests that Dawn is the original ice of House Stark. So let's get to it. Everyone remembers the consistent description of Dawn. It's pale as milk glass, alive with light. Now, real milk glass is a type of opaque or semi-opaque white glass, which is very shiny, almost wet looking. So when Martin describes Dawn as being alive with light, he might be saying that it glows, or he may just be referring to the way that milk glass is shiny and reflective. Myself, I'd lean towards Dawn having some sort of faint magical glow. But either way, you can pretty well picture it. It's a giant, shiny white sword that either plays with reflected light in an interesting way or maybe even glows a little bit. Apart from the way it looks, the maesters say that Dawn is more or less identical to Valerian steel. It's ultra light and seems to be unbreakable. It should be noted that the appearances of Dawn and Valerian steel really are perfect opposites. Whereas Dawn is alive with light, Valerian steel is often described as being smoke dark or a gray so dark it's almost black. And then when Tobomat attempts to color Ned's Valerian steel sword a nice Lannister crimson, he reports back that the color would darken, as if the blade was drinking the sun from it. In other words, the dark swords drink the light, while the white sword is alive with light. The dark swords, the Valerian steel ones, are associated with fire and dragons, as we know. So is it possible that the white sword, Dawn, is associated with ice and the others? Well, I wouldn't base a theory on something so simple as that, although the symmetry is attractive. Hey there, symmetry. Here's the thing, though. The language used to describe Dawn is, for whatever reason, also used to describe the others. Here's what I mean. Dawn is as pale as milk glass, right? Well, so are the bones of the others. That's right. This is from A Storm of Swords, right before Sam stabs the other and it begins to melt. In twenty heartbeats its flesh was gone, swirling away in a fine white mist. Beneath were bones like milk glass, pale and shiny, and they were melting too. Now I want to be clear. Neither the bones of the others nor the white steel of dawn are actually made of milk glass, but rather are simply pale and white and shiny, and so they're compared to milk glass. Real conventional milk glass does make a couple of appearances in A Song of Ice and Fire, but dawn and the others are both magical things with magical compositions. The bones of the others are surely made of some kind of magical ice, while Dawn is seemingly made out of some kind of magical meteoric steel. That said, you do have to wonder about the fact that Martin has chosen the exact same language to describe Dawn and the others. Especially if you like this theory about Dawn being the original ice of House Stark. At the very least, we can say that, in Martin's mind, icy other bones and Dawn basically look the same and can be described with the same words. Thus, you can see the logic in a character in Martin's world seeing a big, shiny white sword that looks like milk glass and thinking that it looks kind of like it's made out of unbreakable ice. So, Dawn probably isn't made from the shin bone of another, but it does kind of look like one. Similarly, I'm pretty sure that Dawn is not the exact same thing as the swords of the others, but, once again, we have to marvel at the fact that the swords of the others and Dawn are described with a lot of the same language. The other slid forward on silent feet, 
In its hand was a long sword like none that Will had ever seen. No human metal had gone into the forging of that blade. It was alive with moonlight, translucent, a shard of crystal so thin that it seemed almost to vanish when seen edge on. There was a faint blue shimmer to the thing, a ghost light that played around its edges, and somehow Will knew it was sharper than any razor. Dawn is famously alive with light, while the other sword here is alive with moonlight, and it shimmers with a faint ghost light. No human metal went into the forging of the other sword. The same is true of Dawn if it was made from a meteorite. And check out the work that the word pale is doing here. Dawn is made from a pale stone of magic powers, and at Starfall, the main tower is called the Pale Stone Sword. Meanwhile, the swords of the others are described as pale swords and pale blades that dance with pale blue light. So while they don't seem to be the same things exactly, both Dawn and the swords of the others are pale blades which are alive with light. Dawn lacks the attractive blue shimmer of the other swords and seems to look more like opaque milk glass than translucent ice crystal, but then again Dawn does look kind of like the bones of the others which are made of ice. The comparison continues with the wielders of these two types of pale blades, both of whom mirror the swords they carry. Dawn is only ever wielded by a knight of Starfall who is declared the Sword of the Morning, a title which draws its name from the sword itself. The word Dawn is more or less synonymous with morning, so both the sword and the wielder are the Sword of the Morning. The most famous Sword of the Morning, Sir Arthur Dane, took the idea of being a white sword person carrying a white sword one step further when he became a white knight of the Kingsguard, who are themselves called the White Swords, and who often wear white steel armor. Arthur Dane was a white sword person twice over, in other words, and at both Starfall and King's Landing, he also lived in a tower named for a white sword. Yes, that's right. It was the Pale Stone Sword Tower at Starfall, and at King's Landing, he lives in the White Sword Tower that all the other Kingsguard live in. The guy just can't get enough of white swords, what can you say? The thing I want you to take away from this is that the wielder of Dawn, the Milky White Sword, is a white sword himself. The same is true of the others, who wield pale swords, but are described as if they themselves are like milky white swords. And this is from a Sam chapter of A Storm of Swords. The other slid gracefully from the saddle to stand upon the snow. Sword slim it was, and milky white. The other is like a milky white sword, and it's even sliding from its saddle, like a sword sliding from its scabbard. Milky white swords pretty much have to make us think of Dawn, the sword that looks like milk glass. And we know what's inside of this milky white sword slim other if we are to peel him open. Bones as pale as milk glass, that's right. And back in the A Game of Thrones prologue, where we're introduced to the others, the flesh of the other is described as as pale as milk, which just needs a glass tagged on the end to make it as pale as milk glass. It gets worse when you consider Arthur Dane again, the white sword person who carries a white sword and always has to live in a tower named after a white sword. Because the white armor and cloaks of the Kingsguard are consistently described as being as white as snow or even as hard as ice, Arthur Dane becoming a white sword of the Kingsguard is actually akin to him becoming a symbolic white ice sword. That is exactly what I'm proposing that Dawn is, a white sword that used to be called ice, whose origin is tied to the Starks, the Others, and what we would call ice magic. When we look at the symbolic language used to describe Dawn, the Kingsguard, and the Others, we see that the Sword of the Morning is like a white ice sword person wielding a white ice sword. So as you can see, Dawn and the others are dressed in the same symbolic language, I would say. Well, I found one other very conspicuous thing which uses all the same descriptive language, pretty much word for word. It's made of ice and magic, but it looks a lot like Dawn, and it's tied to the Starks. Can you guess what it is? It's the wall. That's right, the giant 700 foot tall wall of ice is described in language which is basically interchangeable with all the descriptions of the others and Dawn that we've just spent the first part of this episode looking at. Now, the wall is not made of milk glass, and it's not a sword. However, once again, we'll turn to the descriptive language that Martin has applied to the wall to see just how it is he wants us to think about it. The first quote of note is the one that describes the wall like a snake sword, and this is from a John chapter of A Game of Thrones. He had once heard his Uncle Benjamin say that the wall was a sword east of Castle Black and a snake to the west. It was true. In this quote, Benjamin is talking about how the wall runs straight and smooth over level ground to the east, but has to bend and snake around the knife edge of the many hills to the west. 
But in terms of symbolism, which is what we're taking a look at, Benjen just equated the wall with a snake sword, a phrase which makes us think of dragon steel, since dragons are like winged snakes, and since swords are made of steel, unless they're made of ice. The sun had broken through the clouds. He turned his back on it and lifted his eyes to the wall, blazing blue and crystalline in the sunlight. Even after all these weeks, the sight of it still gave him the shivers. Centuries of wind-blown dirt had pocked and scoured it, covering it like a film, and it often seemed a pale gray, the color of an overcast sky. But when the sun caught it on a bright day, it shone, alive with light, a colossal blue-white cliff that filled up half the sky. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So the wall is like a snake sword that shines alive with light in the sun. That makes us think of dawn, obviously, but of course the wall is made of ice, like the swords of the others are. The wall also blazes blue and crystalline in this quote, and in another quote, the wall is shining like blue crystal, and both of those descriptions make us think of the swords of the others, which are described as a shard of crystal with a faint blue shimmer. So like I said, the descriptions of the wall, when taken together, match both dawn and the swords of the others. The wall is like a giant ice crystal sword with a blue shimmer, but it's also a sun-blazing snake sword, alive with light. Consider also that the wall is manned by the Night's Watch as a bulwark against the others. That's important because the Night's Watch declare themselves the sword in the darkness and the light that brings the dawn. And both of those things sound like the kind of thing that the sword of the morning might say. In other words, the people who are uniquely dedicated to fighting the others and ending any potential long nights are sitting on top of a huge symbol of an alive with light ice sword. This might be a clue that the real sword in the darkness that the Night's Watch needs to wield is a magical ice sword that is alive with light. Jon Snow is the man who commands the Night's Watch, and as a Stark who has many parallels to the last hero, he may be the man to wield the original magical ice sword, the one that's alive with light. In fact, it's almost like our author hangs a giant sign about John's future in the sky when he's north of the wall and observing the dawn. The eastern sky was pink near the horizon and pale gray higher up. The sword of the morning still hung in the south, the bright white star in its hilt blazing like a diamond in the dawn. But the blacks and grays of the darkling forest were once again turning to greens and golds, reds and russets. And above the soldier pines and oaks and ash and sentinels stood the wall, the ice pale and glimmering beneath the dust and dirt that pocked its surface. So there's the Sword of the Morning constellation, hanging in the dawn sky, a celestial star sword to match the earthly star sword known as dawn. It's hanging right above the pale and glittering ice of the wall, and they may be intended as parallel symbols, given all the symbolism that they share, as you've just seen. The bright white star in the hilt of the Sword of the Morning constellation blazes like a diamond in the dawn, just to make sure we're thinking about dawn and flaming star swords. We even have to wonder if dawn might be able to blaze with white fire, kind of like the star in the hilt of its celestial counterpart, or perhaps like the alive with light ice sword that is the wall, which blazes blue and crystalline in the sunlight. And now we're like Bran after hearing the story of Sir Arthur Dane and Dawn, who went to sleep with his head full of knights in gleaming armor, fighting with swords that shone like starfire. Starfire is where we're going to end this, because it's the one thing that Dawn and the others have in common that we haven't talked about yet. That's right. Think about it. Dawn was supposedly made from a pale meteorite stone, the heart of a fallen star. The others and their whites, more than anything else, are recognized by their blue star eyes, of course. Recall that the others themselves are milky white and sword slim, and have bones like milk glass. So, we can actually call them icy milk glass sword people with cold stars in their eyes. Meanwhile, dawn is as pale as milk glass, and it's made from a fallen star. To put it bluntly, that's an awful lot of icy star sword symbolism shared between dawn and the others, for whatever reason. Perhaps the answer is that dawn is in some sense an ice sword with a connection to the others. So what about the fire part of Starfire? Well, not only do Tales of Dawn fill Bran's head with dreams of swords shining like Starfire, there's also a Samwell Starfire Dane in the history books to again beg the question of whether or not Dawn might be able to catch on fire. If Dawn is Lightbringer, then it should be able to catch on fire. But if it's the original ice, and if it has some connection to ice magic and the others, then it might not burn with regular fire, right? Well, I believe the answer comes in those blue star eyes of the others. Gilly says they burn as bright 
and cold as blue stars. So maybe cold starfire is the ticket. Right in the A Game of Thrones prologue, we are warned by Garrett that nothing burns like the cold. And that's right before we get a glimpse of the eyes of the others, which were a blue that burned like ice. Perhaps that's what we'll see if dawn catches fire. A blue flame or a pale or white flame, something that burns like the cold. After all, we just saw that the wall parallels dawn as an alive with light ice sword, and the wall also blazes blue and crystalline in the sunlight, as if it were lit up with cold blue sunfire. And that's basically the same thing as cold blue starfire. You've heard of fighting fire with fire, right? Well, perhaps you have to fight the burning cold with the burning cold. We already know that dragon glass, called frozen fire, can kill the others. And that's kind of the same idea as Dawn being able to burn with some sort of cold fire or cold star fire, but still being able to kill the others. The message is that fire, turned cold or frozen, is a potent weapon indeed. After all, nothing burns like the cold. Nothing burns like ice on fire.